big claims in this one. The response is going to be interesting. All right, Carl, we're going to try. Some people might be a little peeved, but uh, we're going to go for it. Hair's looking sufficiently like a croissant. Oh, okay, let's just rip this Band-Aid off. Today I'm going to tell you about how the Bible was invented by a heretic. This is not me being hyperbolic. This is not a clickbait title. I hired a PhD in early Christian literature to help me produce this video. Uh, he specializes in this subject especially, so yeah. The, the Bible was invented by a heretic. Who knew? Actually, everyone in the field of New Testament studies probably knows, but uh, this is not common knowledge. A second century Christian named Marcion may be personally responsible for what we think of as a Bible. You won't find Marcion's Bible in any bookstores today, and Marcion's version of Christianity isn't something most of us would even recognize. But this man's influence was seriously profound. So, who exactly was Marcion? What were his scriptures? And what does it mean to claim that he invented the Bible? Stick with me, the invention of the Bible by one of the faith's most famous heretics is going to take some time to unpack. The Life and Teaching of Marcion Marcion was born sometime near the end of the first century in Sinop, a port city on the northern coast of modern-day Turkey. To say much more than that about Marcion's early life is difficult. Our only sources about the guy are Marcion's opponents, who invented several embarrassing stories about his youth in order to discredit him. This was a standard practice among ancient polemicists, even for those who were, you know, good Christian boys. One detail about Marcion's early life that wasn't fabricated is that he enjoyed some success in Sinop's shipping industry. Many of Marcion's earliest opponents describe him as a ship owner. Although a few people poke fun at his line of work, this biographical detail doesn't seem designed to discredit the so-called heretic. There's nothing inherently shameful or illegitimate about running commercial vessels around the Mediterranean. On the contrary, this meant Marcion had some pull in the ancient world. His personal wealth and ability to travel freely around the known world proved significant for the history of Christianity and the creation of the Bible. Marcion steps onto the world stage in the mid-140 CE when he relocated from Sinope to the heart of the empire, the city of Rome. At this point, Marcion was far from the first Christian in the capital. Christianity had a long history in Rome by the middle of the second century. Once there, Marcion discovered a host of well-established Christian communities, including followers of various Gnostic teachers like Valentinus and his disciples, as well as the predecessors of Christians who would eventually win the title Orthodox. This last group accepted Marcion for a time because, as one 4th century source tells us, he presented them with a letter of commendation. And 200,000 sesterces. Now, if my calculations are right, considering all relevant economic factors, then that comes out to a modern day, uh, a, a lot of money. Just, it was a lot of money. We don't know how long the goodwill lasted between Marcion and the Roman Christians. Likewise, we're not sure how it ended. But our sources do describe Marcion's conflict with a group of Roman elders over the interpretation of some of Jesus' parables. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will one tear the new garment, but the piece from the new will not match the old garment. Similarly, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will spill out, and the skins will be ruined. In this saying, known from all three synoptic gospels, Jesus contrasts the novelty of his teaching with the doctrine and practices of the Pharisees and scribes, his fellow Jews. He refers to his teaching as new wine or an unshrunk cloth in comparison with the old wine or old garment of his contemporaries. This Jesus tradition probably emerged from the conflicts between some of Jesus' earliest followers. It took decades for Christians to differentiate themselves from contemporary varieties of Judaism, and this saying seems to belong to those very early days when Jesus' followers were trying to distinguish themselves from other Yahweh worshippers. But Marcion interpreted this Jesus tradition as a total denunciation of Christianity's Jewish inheritance. The teachings of Jesus, Marcion believed, should not be mixed up with Jewish beliefs and practices. Christianity's relationship to its Jewish heritage is an evergreen issue in Christian theology. From Paul's conflict with Judaizing missionaries in Galatia to contemporary evangelical appropriations of the temple tithe to fund their churches, followers of Jesus have struggled to determine the extent to which Gentile converts were bound by Jewish practice and belief. 
On this issue, Marcion adopted an extreme position, perhaps the most anti-Judaic position ever articulated. Keeping Jesus' new wine free from old skins, according to Marcion, meant discarding the Jewish scriptures entirely. According to Marcion, there was no Old Testament. The Creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the giver of the Mosaic Law, and the Lord of the Jewish prophets could not, therefore, be Jesus' Father. Jesus had not come as the Davidic Messiah. He did not fulfill the Law and prophets. He was not the salvation of Israel. Instead, Jesus came to save all of humanity from the Creator, His Law, and His Judgment. The God of the Jewish Scriptures, according to Marcion, was the villain in the story of salvation. Marcion found further evidence for this critical conception of the Creator, or as I like to call it, Big Meaty Theory, in another saying of Jesus. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. This synoptic tradition seems to have originated in a controversy over evaluating true and false teachers within the early Jesus movement. Teachers should be evaluated, according to the saying, by their behavior, not just their doctrines. Marcion, not unreasonably, applied the same test to the God of the Jewish scriptures. I make peace and create evil, declares the Lord in Isaiah 45, 7. Marcion observed that God deceives people, deploys harmful spirits, wields famine and disease, and otherwise misbehaves. Such bad fruit, Marcion argued, could only come from a bad tree. If Jesus wasn't the son of this God, then who was he? Jesus, reasoned Marcion, must have been sent by another God entirely. Jesus proclaimed a God of love, mercy, and grace. This was good fruit, and it must have come from a good and therefore different tree. Jesus was the emissary of an otherwise unknown but entirely good God. It was good versus evil, shark boy and lava girl against George Lopez's disembodied head, Marcion's merciful deity versus the wrathful God of Jewish scripture. Does that reference date me? I think it does. That's, that movie's kind of old now. For this contrast between gods, Marcion thought he had an ally in the Apostle Paul. Paul's epistles contrast law with grace, old with new, and condemnation with the spirit of life. After all, what had Paul fought with the church in Jerusalem over? It was their continued observation of Jewish practices. Paul even had to uh, correct Jesus' own disciples on the issue. The way Marcion saw it, new wine was still being poured into the same old wineskins. Although Christians in Rome were not still debating the circumcision of Gentile converts in the mid-2nd century, Marcion saw the Roman Church's continued use of the Jewish scriptures as a failure to recognize the newness of Jesus' revelation. The identification of Jesus' father with the God of Israel was just another attempt to mend the old garment with a new patch. Now, the leaders of the would-be Orthodox Christian community in Rome, intriguingly described as a college of elders, not a single bishop, disputed Marcion's interpretation of Jesus' teaching. You called their god an evil tree. What did you expect? You okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm wait, wait, is I, it... I, yeah, I'm just filming a bit. Christianity, they contended, was a new covenant established between humanity and the Creator, the God of the Jewish law and prophets. Descriptions of this God's ignorance, malice, misconduct in the Old Testament should be interpreted allegorically or otherwise explained. This difference of opinion between Marcion and the Roman elders proved irresolvable, and the church in Rome returned Marcion's very generous donation. In the highly conventional gift-giving culture of ancient Rome, returning such a gift amounted to a formal dissociation. Poor Marcion. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. I have been editing it for this amount of facial hairs worth of time. But I literally just got an email from New Testament scholar Dr. Bart Ehrman's team about a new course that they are coming out with, so I wanted to give that a plug. It's called The Unknown Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it answers several questions that I know you guys have because you've left them in my comments before. Questions like, how much of the Gospels are legend versus how much are history? How can we date them? How can we know when they were written? When and why did scholars actually start to question their historical value? He'll also, um nicely correct some things that Christian apologists have spread about the Gospels, like eyewitnesses to Jesus' life would have corrected anything that was wrong in the Gospels, so obviously the Gospels got it right. Oral cultures have special techniques to pass down their histories accurately, so all the accounts that the Gospels are based on must have been accurate. The Gospels are reliable. You know, 
that kind of thing. This will be an eight lecture course with Q&A, so if you attend live, you'll get to ask Dr. Ermin your questions yourself. It'll be live on August 6th and 7th, 2022, but if you're watching this after that, don't worry. Anyone who signs up at any time will get permanent access to the recordings. Click my link in the description and pinned comment to sign up, and if you do so before July 27th, you'll also get an early bird discount. The video that you're watching right now only exists because I put 100% of the money I make from these things back into the channel. I'm paying the scholar that wrote this video with the money that I made from the last Bart Ehrman event that I promoted. So if you guys want more scholarly or just high quality videos on my channel, then maybe consider checking it out. Thank you to everyone who's signed up so far. You guys have made this channel, I think, better than it's ever been. So I really appreciate you. Now back to the video. Was Marcion a Gnostic? I've mentioned Marcion on my channel a few times before, and one of the main questions, or rather very confident assertions I received about him was about his status as a Gnostic. So was Marcion a Gnostic or not? This is a difficult question to answer because, as scholars now recognize, there never was a single church of the Gnostics. In ancient literature, the term was used for a variety of purposes. Some heresiologists use the term Gnostic to group together very different kinds of Christians and thereby discredit them all in one fell swoop. Followers of the teacher Valentinus railed against the followers of Basilides, and the Syrian teacher Bardason opposed the churches of Marcion, but heresiologists still just labeled them all Gnostic. When we read the heresiologists, it's important to remember that, like most religious apologists today, they're not writing to engage their opponents in dialogue, but rather writing to assure their base that they have good reason to disregard any alternative to their way of seeing things. Grouping together every teacher you don't like as Gnostic was a convenient strategy for doing that. Still, other Christians may have used the term Gnostic similarly to the way some people use intellectual as a quasi-title today. After all, the term Gnostic is derived from gnosis, meaning knowledge. Someone's claim to be a Christian intellectual in this way wouldn't tell you anything specific about their faith tradition, just that they wanted to present themselves as knowledgeable, learned. I know what r slash I am very smart would be populated with if it existed 1800 years ago, a bunch of Gnostic boys. <laughs> For the most part, though, the people who either called themselves Gnostics or were labeled Gnostics by ancient polemicists were those Christians who were influenced by contemporary trends in philosophy, especially Platonism. In brief, Plato had taught that humans could transcend their materiality to contemplate the immaterial forms of reality itself through education in mathematics, music, and geometry. The term Gnostic seems to have attached itself to Christians who, like contemporary Platonists, denigrated the material world and emphasized knowledge as important for salvation. So let's finally try to answer the question. If we take the denigration of the material world and emphasis on salvation through knowledge as our working definition for Gnosticism, was Marcion a Gnostic? The answer is… sort of. Marcion believed that the material world was the creation of an evil deity, so yes, Marcion had a lower view of the material world than would-be Orthodox Christians. Matter wasn't the source or ultimate instrument of evil for Marcion as it was for some Gnostics, but it wasn't God's good work destined for salvation either. On this particular issue, Marcion resembles the Gnostics. However, Marcion didn't teach salvation by knowledge. Like would-be Orthodox Christians, Marcion understood Paul to teach that humans are saved by faith. In this very important respect, Marcion differs from the groups labeled Gnostic. Consequently, few scholars today consider Marcion a Gnostic teacher. So in the future, anytime anyone comments that Marcion was obviously a Gnostic, how did you not know that you're going to be hit with a timestamp to this section of this video? <laughs> Marcion's success after Rome. A Roman Christian in the early 150s known as Justin the Martyr describes Marcion as currently engaged in missionary activities reaching many of every nation. This contemporary reference to Marcion's travels indicates that within a single decade of his arrival to Rome, Marcion had already planted plenty of his own churches abroad. Considering the seafaring, swashbuckling lad that he was, this is not too surprising. Although, Marcion probably did not leave Rome immediately after breaking with the Roman elders, or at least he didn't leave permanently. The first generation of Marcion's disciples were still present in Rome in the second half of the second century. 
This suggests that Marcion maintained some kind of teaching ministry in the capital city after severing his relationship with the older community of Christians in Rome. Maybe he stayed for a few years, or maybe he treated Rome as a home base, returning after his missionary journeys. We're not really sure. Literary and material sources from the following centuries are rife with evidence for the prominence of Marcionite Christianity. Marcionite priests and bishops appear in historians, martyr lists, dialogues, and inscriptions. A 4th century building near Damascus in Syria bears the inscription, A Synagogue of the Marcionites. This brings us to the most remarkable evidence for the success of Marcion's mission, reports about the distribution of Christians in the Syriac-speaking East. Non-Marcionite Christians in 4th century literature complained that there, locals identified them by the names of particular Christian teachers in order to indicate that they were what we would today call Orthodox Christians. This is because the label Christian all by itself was used to refer to followers of Marcion. Based on this and other evidence, many historians believe that Marcionites represented the majority party of Christians in the Eastern Roman and Western Persian empires. As is the case with many such figures in early Christian history, the end of Marcion's life is shrouded in mystery. Marcion was probably more successful than his opponents wished to advertise. Heresiologists would prefer that Marcion's story ended when he was expelled from what they considered the true church. It did them no good to record that Marcion died the esteemed founder of a pan-Mediterranean network of churches. Modern historians are left to infer what they can from stories about Marcion's many disciples, the communities that revered him, and all the other Christians who felt compelled to respond to Marcion's influential ideas. The Invention of the Christian Bible So, we've met Marcion. Now, what does it mean to say that he invented the Christian Bible? Today we encounter the Bible as a single pleather-bound volume with tiny print and a helpful table of contents, but the Bible, of course, is not a single work. It may be one physical book, but that book is an anthology of several dozen works. Modern Bibles collect independently circulating books composed by ancient Israelites, Second Temple Jews, and early Christians. As such, modern Bibles will vary in their contents. The Jewish Study Bible, King James Version, and Orthodox Study Bible, to name a few, are all widely read English translations with different tables of content. On top of that, the English translations of any one work within these different Bibles is based on different underlying text traditions. The Jewish and Orthodox Study Bibles are not even translating the same text of Genesis. Given this diverse body of literature that circulates under the same deceptively simple title, what is a Bible? Here's a simple definition for the sake of this discussion. A collection of books deemed uniquely authoritative by a religious community. This working definition seems to cover the spectrum of ordinary uses of the term. Such a concept, it's important to recognize, is distinct from the notions of scripture and canon. To clarify what I am not claiming for Marcion, it's important to unpack these related notions really quick. Christians had authoritative texts, aka scripture, well before Marcion. With only a few possible exceptions, the works now collected in modern Bibles were written before Marcion came to Rome. For instance, Christians started using various books about Jesus as well as Paul's letters as scriptural authorities sometime in the late first century. Sometimes these circulated in individual book rolls or sometimes in small collections of related works. Marcion did not invent scripture, but still, first century believers had no single Bible. The question of canon is trickier. Literally speaking, the term refers to a measuring instrument. Applied metaphorically to a religious, intellectual, or literary tradition, a canon is the collection of sources against which other sources of information should be evaluated. Canons, therefore, are catalogs of authoritative sources. Some Jews in the 1st and 2nd centuries, like the priest-turned-historian Josephus, had produced canon lists of the Jewish scriptures. There's good evidence, however, that Christians before Marcion had not yet developed a canon for their own scriptures. Christians in the 2nd century took an ad hoc approach to their scriptures. That is, they used whichever books they thought preserved the life and teachings of Jesus and his apostles, without any appeal to an authoritative standard. Justin, an orthodox contemporary of Marcion in Rome, utilized a gospel of Peter, an infancy gospel, and other sayings of Jesus without any known source, all of which are non-canonical today. Another orthodox Christian of the same time, Tatian, just wrote his own gospel. 
early Orthodox sermons like the work known as Second Clement and summaries of the gospel like that found in the Epistle of the Apostles recount stories of Jesus found in both canonical and non-canonical gospels. Clearly, Christians of all stripes, including the would-be Orthodox, used a variety of gospels throughout the second century. But Marcion, decades before any other proponent of a Christian canon, took a different approach. Gospels that depict Jesus fulfilling the law or prophets had been corrupted, according to Marcion, by the ever-present temptation to Judaize. So he published one, and exactly one, gospel alongside a collection of exactly ten Pauline epistles. Marcion introduced this selection of Christian scriptures with his own original composition, the Antitheses. This work attacked other gospels, argued for the acceptance of Marcion's chosen scriptures, and introduced Marcion's theological system. We don't know whether Marcion bound these 12 works into a single codex, although one relatively late Syriac source suggests he did. Still, Marcion set out a list of precisely which Christian writings were authoritative for his churches and, in his antitheses, pointedly excluded the alternatives. This collection of scriptures, produced by a so-called heretic sometime in the mid-2nd century, has a strong claim to be the first Christian Bible. Now, here's something I find really amusing because it just, it just strikes me as so weird by today's standards. Marcion's Bible did not actually evoke controversy in 2nd century Rome. By all accounts, Marcion's conflict with the elders in Rome concerned the interpretation of Jesus' traditions, not competing Christian canons. That is, Marcion and his Roman interlocutors argued over what Jesus meant by such and such, not what books Christians should read. This shows just how innovative the idea was. It was so novel that the Orthodox weren't even mad about it. And, I mean, why would they be? There was no competing Christian canon. It would only be later, in response to Marcion, that Christians would argue for an orthodox canon of Christian scriptures against Marcion's canon. It wouldn't be until Irenaeus, at the end of the second century, that Marcion's critics would assert an alternative fourfold gospel collection. Even then, Irenaeus himself draws on other collections of Jesus' traditions in his own works. In the end, Marcion's work compelled his opponents to articulate their own conceptions of Christian scripture and, in turn, craft a rival Christian canon. This would take decades to popularize and centuries to standardize. In this way, Marcion not only produced the first Christian Bible, but also inspired his Orthodox opponents to build a Bible of their own. The Contents of Marcion's Bible We've discussed the phenomenon of Marcion's Bible without saying much about its actual content. Which singular gospel did Marcion choose, and which ten letters of Paul? Answering this question entangles us in a series of historical puzzles. Marcion's opponents, our only source of information about Marcion, agree that he took a copy of the Gospel of Luke and rewrote it to eliminate all the problematic connections between Jesus and Judaism. The Lucan Nativity, for instance, is full of references to Jewish scripture, depicting Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. So, Marcion, according to his opponents at least, simply removed the entire sequence. He did the same to the preaching of John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, and about a quarter of Luke's gospel. Now, this heresiologist named Tertullian got in some uh, pretty wicked burns on Marcion. In his five-volume work dedicated to attacking Marcion, Tertullian calls him the Pontic Mouse in order to, you know, describe Marcion gnawing apart the gospel. In another memorable line, Tertullian says Marcion wrote his gospel with a knife instead of a pen. I, I like that one a little bit better. Marcion's opponents want you to imagine Marcion creating a custom gospel by just tearing apart an old one. There's an ongoing scholarly debate on this point. Some scholars have argued that Marcion just promoted a gospel and letter collection that he received from his home church, and that the idea that Marcion himself edited and compiled his scriptures was an invention of Marcion's critics. After all, these scholars say, Marcion's Bible preserved some passages that we would have expected Marcion to delete. Still, most scholars think Marcion was responsible for his distinctive scriptures for the following reasons. There is plenty of evidence that Luke existed more or less in its received, non-Marcionite form before and throughout Marcion's ministry, meaning that Marcion promoted a highly distinctive form of this gospel. 
Marcion's gospel doesn't seem to have been utilized much outside of Marcionite communities, suggesting that it originated within the same sect. With the Creator and His Law, the Patriarchs and the Prophets written out of Jesus' words, Marcion's Gospel and letters seem to have been rewritten in a way that fits his theology just a little too well. So was Marcion responsible for the distinctive shape of his scriptures? I'll let you decide. Actually, no, I take that back. Let the scholars decide on this one because, let's face it, you and I, we know really nothing on this subject compared to actual scholars in the field. Let, let's let them figure it out. By all reports, Marcion's treatment of the Pauline text was more conservative than his treatment of the gospel. A few references to God's covenant with the people of Israel are omitted from Romans and Galatians, but Marcion included Paul's other epistles unaltered. Marcion did not include the pastoral epistles, but that's probably because Marcion just never knew they existed. Scholars now widely recognize these works as later pseudepigrapha, which were probably not yet widely accepted as Pauline in the first half of the second century. By the way, in a previous video, I go into detail about why scholars don't think these books were written by Paul. I'll link that in the cards and description for you to check out after you get done watching this one. The only other significant difference between Marcion's Bible and the Pauline corpus in modern Bibles is the title of the Epistle to the Ephesians. In Marcion's collection, this letter was titled the Epistle to the Laodiceans. Some surviving manuscripts of the Epistle to the Ephesians lack the address to the church in Ephesus. Also, a reference in Colossians to a companion letter to the Laodiceans suggests that the Epistle to Ephesians was once known by this other name. So this difference in titles probably wasn't Marcion's doing. Now, you might be wondering how we know all of this if no manuscripts of any of Marcion's scriptures has survived and Marcion's work is only preserved in the work of his critics. Although this kind of evidence does present difficulties, the situation really isn't as desperate as it might sound. Tertullian, a third century heresiologist I mentioned earlier, dedicated the entire fourth volume of a five-volume treatise to a passage-by-passage -passage critique of Marcion's Gospel. His fifth volume does the same with Marcion's Pauline epistles. A little over a hundred years later, another ecclesiastical writer named Epiphanius independently composed a critique of Marcion and his Bible. Like Tertullian, Epiphanius quotes Marcion's Bible extensively. Apart from these two sources, a dozen other authors in antiquity discuss Marcion's Bible. Although there are significant holes in our knowledge and uncertainties around specific wording, Marcion's scriptures can be reconstructed in remarkable detail, considering that we have no direct text tradition. All right, now to sum up what we've covered. The so-called heretic Marcion, it seems, was the first Christian to promote an exhaustive collection of uniquely authoritative texts. The first Christian Bible was invented to exclude both the Jewish scriptures and other Christian writings as textual authorities. In response, non-Marcionite Christians were compelled to defend their use of other gospel texts and formulate how they believed the Jewish scriptures should be used in Christian theology and practice. Most of these would-be Orthodox Christians would coalesce around the four-gospel canon first defended by Irenaeus at the end of the second century, partially in response to the Marcionite challenge. Thus, Marcion is responsible for the creation of the Christian Bible not only because he was the first Christian to produce an authoritative collection of Christian scriptures, but also because he prompted Christians to eventually formulate the Christian Bible that we recognize today. In closing, I'd like to share some of my own reflections on all of this. I was taught that the Christian Bible as we know it today came together in a very straightforward way. The earliest Christians had the canon in mind from the very beginning, it was completed within the first century, and no real Christian ever deviated from it. That narrative fit my theological assumptions about the divinity behind the Bible's creation, but I now realize that narrative isn't defensible historically. The very idea of a Christian Bible was invented by a flawed human being who, while probably just trying to do his best to answer life's biggest questions like anyone else, upheld views unrecognizable as Christian today. The Bible, I've come to understand, emerged from centuries of messy theological conflict, and while the apparent humanness of its origins was tough to accept at first, I now think that humanness makes it even more fascinating.
Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A huge thanks to Dr. Ian Mills for writing this one and putting up with me diluting it with a bunch of stupid jokes. Dr. Mills is actually quite the expert on Marcion, so I'm very, very grateful to have this specific work of his on my channel. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.